What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. I am so excited to cover this case today. I've avoided it for a very long time because if I'm being real honest, it kind of scares the absolute crap out of me. Um, you will understand why when I tell you the story. A lot of you guys are probably already very familiar with this story. Um, but I realized when I started looking it up on my own that there's a whole bunch of First of all, misinformation out there. There's also not a really great place to go and get almost all the information you possibly can in one spot. So I feel like I left every bit of coverage of this a little bit confused. And so I really wanted to do this as much justice as I possibly could so you can maybe understand this a little bit better if this is something you've already heard about. So. Before I dive into how ridiculous this entire case is, I need to say a huge thank you to Hunt a Killer for bringing you guys today's video. If you're not aware of what Hunt a Killer is, first of all, it's my absolute favorite thing in the entire world. And second of all, it is a murder mystery subscription box that comes straight to your door monthly and it is hands down, the most unique game I've ever played. And I love games. I love board games. I love video games. I've always been a fan of those little true crime books that you can get at the grocery store. Um, I have like three of them sitting at my desk, uh, but this is like that come to life. Each season of Hunt a Killer consists of six episodes or six boxes revolving around one specific crime. And I realized I've never showed you the box before. So I figured I'd pull one of my boxes out and show you. This is the box and it's absolutely amazing. So this is one month's worth of information. There are piles of documents in here. There's pieces of evidence. There's audio recordings, potentially case files, um, all sorts of information. And it's so cool because it all looks so realistic. This season in particular is about uh, a woman named Julie Adler. She actually unearthed the remains of a famous actress from the 1930s. So all of the evidence looks like it's actually dated back to the 1930s. So it makes it so realistic. Um, but Julie Adler ends up finding these remains in her family theater and something that was always originally believed to be a disappearance turned into a homicide. And what your job is, is to examine all of the evidence and solve the murder. You have to find the murder weapon, eliminate suspects, and it's not easy. There's a lot of hidden things. I've said it before, but you could have to hold something up to light or flip something upside down or maybe layer things on top of each other. And each box adds more information to what you already have. So your opinion could constantly be changed. Changing. And then when you think you figured out the task of that box, you email it in and then you get a response telling you if you're right or not. So it's really, really cool. Hunt a Killer is perfect for a monthly date night or maybe a monthly girls night. You can even sit down and do this with your family. Each person can be given one task or one piece of evidence to examine. And then you can all come together and see what your thoughts are at the very end. And then probably one of the things that I love the most about Hunt a Killer and purchasing these boxes is that proceeds from every single box go straight to the Cold Case Foundation. And I have have a serious place in my heart for cold cases. Right now, just for my subscribers, you guys can go to huntakiller.com forward slash Danielle Hallen and use code Hallen for 20% off of your first box. Again, please make sure to use code Hallen for 20% discount. It's just a really cool experience. I really think you guys would enjoy it. So there you go. All the information will be linked down in the description box. And thank you again to Hunt a Killer for sponsoring today's video. As I stated before, today I'm going to be speaking about the unsolved, very, <laughs> that's an understatement, very suspicious death of Gareth Williams. Um, there are dozens and dozens of theories in this case, most involving different governments and mafias and spies and secret agents and the list just goes on and on and on. I don't think I've ever seen so many theories in a single case ever before. I honestly question if this is a case that will ever be solved just because of the different moving parts and the people involved. But this is definitely one where you can go down so many rabbit holes and I cannot wait to hear your opinions on this. That's kind of one of the largest reasons I decided to go ahead and do this is because I want to know what you guys think because I can't for the life of me figure out what my standpoint is on this case. So Gareth Williams was 31 years old when he was found dead in the most bizarre way, but as I always do, I want to get into his background first. Gareth was born and raised in Wales with his parents and his sister, and he was 
always so intelligent. Graduated with a degree in math at only 17 years old, and that in itself is mind blowing, but then he went from there and attended the University of Manchester, where he again graduated with a PhD, and then after that, he wasn't done, so he continued on to Cambridge. Now, he ended up dropping out of Cambridge for a job, and the job was at a place called GCHQ. GCHQ stands for Government Communications Headquarters, and it's basically an intelligence agency based in the UK that works as a cyber and security agency. Now, Gareth was, like I said, brilliant. So he was very, very good at math, very good with numbers and code cracking, code breaking. So that was his specialty. He worked a lot with computers, but there's not a whole lot known really about his personal life. He kept a lot of that very private. I'm assuming partly because of the line of work that he was in, but it also just seemed to be who he was. He really genuinely preferred to keep to himself. He would rather spend his time you know, working, crunching numbers, cycling, or working out. I believe he worked for GCHQ for 10 years. Um, it's at least somewhere around there. He was there for an extended period of time and he decided randomly to leave GCHQ and move to Pimlico, London to work for MI6. And now I I hope all of you know what that is, um, but if you don't, that's a part of the Secret Intelligence Service, also known as SIS. Basically, it's like James Bond in real life. MI6 mainly focuses on stopping terrorism, giving the UK a cyber advantage, which is a lot of what I believe Gareth was doing while he was there. And then also, according to their website, they disrupt the activity of hostile states. So as you can see, it's kind of an intense job to have. Um, again, it's secret, so not a lot of people know what exactly goes on there. So while we have an idea of what he was doing, I feel like majority of people don't actually know. Now, when he moved to London to work for MI6, he rented out a top floor apartment. There's a lot of conflicting information about this apartment he lived in online. I've seen across the board that it says it's a security service safe house. So like these agents and people are put in this so they're protected. Um, but I've actually seen the SIS say that that's not true, that it is not a safe house. They do not house their people there. Um, I've also seen, however, that GCHQ apparently bought this particular apartment and would just kind of transfer their people back back and forth. Um, all I know is that from what I've seen stated by these agencies, this was not a safe house, um, which is what it's been described as and everyone assumes it's been for a very, very long time. Um, there was no sort of security there. It wasn't anything like that. There ended up being some issues when he was working with MI6. I think he only managed to work for them for about a year. He began to complain to his sister that there was friction. And I don't know exactly what that means. I'm sure he couldn't really go into detail about it, but he decided because of this friction that he was going to go back to his job working for HCGQ. One week before he was set to make this move back to GCHQ, he was found dead. In the second week of August, and I don't have an exact date again because sketchy information, Gareth's sister could not get in touch with him. And this was unlike him, they seemed to be relatively close. It got to the point that she decided to call MI6 herself to figure out what exactly was going on and where Gareth was, if he was showing up to work, and she was shocked at what they told her. MI6 said that Gareth had not been at work for a week. She had called MI6 on the 23rd of August 2010, so he had been gone for a week before that, and no one had any idea, and apparently MI6 had not thought to call authorities or check on him or anything. Now, this was shocking to her and obviously shocking to me and probably a lot of you that are hearing this because this is a secret agency. <laughs> um, their employees have a lot of knowledge that not a lot of people have and work in situations that put them at a very high risk. 
And it's just kind of surprising to me that one of their employees can go missing for an entire week and they not notice it. And so I've tried to justify this quite a few times thinking, well, you know, he wasn't, he'd only been working there for a year. So it's not like he was one of their star employees, but apparently he was supposed to host two different meetings. Like he was in charge of two pretty large meetings when it comes to cyber safety and things like that. And he didn't show up for them. So not just him, but all of these other employees are showing up for these meetings and he's not there. And not a single person was like, uh, you know, he hasn't showed up for work in a couple days. We might want to check on him. Because of this, Metropolitan Police were called and sent out to Gareth's home for a welfare check. When they arrived, nobody was answering the door. So they eventually had to force their way into the apartment and they began to look around. Now, right off the bat, it didn't appear that there was any sign of forced entry. The door appeared to be locked up just fine. Things in the apartment didn't seem disrupted. The only odd thing they noticed right away was that the heat in the apartment was set all the way up. It was blazing hot. And this was summer months in the UK. And while they don't get wildly hot, it's definitely not a time where the heat needed to be on like that. They did a quick sweep of the home and realized that Gareth was not there, at least they thought. So they decided to take a deeper search into the home to see if there was anything missing, anything off. All of his personal items were there. They were all laid out on the floor. And I don't know, something about the way they're laid out kind of wigs me out a little bit, but it's his laptop and his phone and his phone charger and a notebook. And they're all kind of just laid on the floor beside his couch. Everything else seemed to be completely fine and in its proper place, but then they went into the bathroom. Inside of the bathtub was a red hold all North Face zip up bag. And I'm sure a lot of you guys already know where this is going. Um, the bag was fully zipped up and had a padlock on it that was secured. And there was obviously something rather large inside of it. Once the bag was investigated further, it was found that Gareth himself was dead inside of the bag. He was completely naked and the key to the lock was found underneath his body. Because the heat had been turned so high in the apartment, his body was decomposing at an accelerated rate. So it was really not clear um, or it couldn't really be established just from looking at him when exactly he died, how long he had been inside of the bag. Gareth was taken to the corner and the apartment was completely sealed up. I'm talking it was guarded by armed police officers and an investigation began. The state of the bathroom was probably one of the first things they found very odd because you would assume there would be DNA, fingerprints, footprints, palm prints, um, blood, you know, scuff marks, something in the bathroom, regardless of what exactly happened. But there was nothing. I've seen through a couple of sources, there may have been one scuff mark on the bathtub that may indicate that he was kind of picked up in the bag and put into the bathtub. Um, but I've also seen reports saying that that is not a real thing and that doesn't exist. But what I do know for sure is that there was not a single fingerprint in that bathroom. No fingerprints on the edge of the tub as if someone like held it to get in. So if, you know, Gareth maybe got in, no one, you know, braced themselves while they were trying to put the bag in. Um, there were no footprints as if someone was walking, you know, in and out of the bathroom. Uh, there was no palm print. I mean, nothing all over the entire bathroom. They tried to check the padlock, obviously, because that could easily give some answers as to who was holding it to lock it. Not a single fingerprint was on the padlock. There was no DNA or anything on the uh, zipper. It made absolutely no sense. It was to the point where you would be led to believe that the bathroom in the very least had been cleaned. Now, when it comes to DNA in the bathroom, I have seen that they were able to take quite a few samples from the bathroom. Since they were heavily relying on this, since there was no other evidence, they sent this off for testing right away. And when it came back, it shockingly came back as one of the forensic investigators' DNA. So basically, the crime scene had been contaminated. So they had absolutely nothing. Gareth's body also gave authorities no clues either. He had no scratches on his body. 
There were no defensive wounds. There was no obvious sign like underneath his fingernails or anything that he had attempted to get himself out of the bag. There was no evidence from the inside of the bag either that he had tried to get himself out. He had not been stabbed. He had not been shot. He had not been strangled. He had not been tied up. I have seen on a few sources that there were a few bruises potentially on his elbows, but other sources say there were no bruises at all. Again, the information in this case is just something else, um, but nothing at all showed what his cause of death was, what exactly happened to him. It didn't appear he got in a fight with anybody. It made absolutely no sense. So then they're thinking, okay, well, maybe he was poisoned or, you know, something, but the toxicology screen came back. There were no drugs in him. There was no poison in him. There was no alcohol in him. However, the catch to that is that he had been decomposing since they found since August 16th. So he had essentially, from the moment he stopped showing up to work, he had been dead since then. He'd been dead that entire week. And because the accelerated decomposition, a lot of those things may have completely left his system by the time they tested for it. So if there was like a fast acting poison um, or you know just enough of a dosage of drugs that might have killed him, it might not have shown up. Now, because of his worth, the Metropolitan Police and the SIS had to have a meeting to decide how exactly they were going to approach this investigation. And as if that's not difficult enough, because the SIS knows that a lot of digging into his background could cause them problems, it could out a lot of things that they need to keep secret. He also was working with the NSA from the US and the FBI. So he also was working with a whole bunch of other intelligence agencies and the US contacted the UK and said, look, don't you dare let any information on what he was working with us about out into the public or just out to anybody. All of this stuff has to be completely locked down. So all of the typical routes you would take when someone is murdered or missing to look into their background, understand what was happening in their lives, um, if there was any conflict or issues, basically, Metropolitan Police could not touch any of that information. I'm not exactly sure how much the Metropolitan Police and the SIS worked together at first. Um, I don't know if they even ever came to a conclusion on if one or the other was fully taking the case. And I think they just kind of both did their own investigation. But I do know that there was a huge lack of communication between the two. When the SIS went to do their own separate investigation, they wanted to make sure that there was no sign of forced entry, but for some strange reason, the Metropolitan Police had completely taken off the door and the lock to the apartment. So there basically was contamination again of the crime scene and the SIS couldn't determine if there was any forced entry, but issues went the other way as well. When Gareth's office was searched, there was a black North Face bag, just like the red one he was found in, I believe underneath his desk, and it was filled with personal items. And the SIS apparently would not let Metropolitan Police or anyone take this bag or search it because they claimed it had sensitive information inside of it. But from what I've seen, it was personal belongings, so I'm not quite sure what they thought may have been in there. And I also find it very odd he had that many personal items at work with him. It was just very frustrating for everyone because Metropolitan Police and Gareth's family could not understand how an agency like that could simply ignore one of their employees not showing up to work for a week. And they didn't seem very cooperative when it came to helping Metropolitan Police out with the investigation. This was going absolutely nowhere, so an inquest began. But when this started, it was not very long before his private, very personal life was just unraveled for everyone to see. He'd visited bondage websites, gone to gay bars and bought tickets to drag shows. Police have revealed new details about the intensely private life of MI6 spy Gareth Williams, who was found dead in his London flat in August. Officers leading the investigation said that they hoped the information would help explain what happened to Mr Williams, whose naked body was discovered tied up and locked inside a bag. And in Gareth had a lot of women's clothing found in his apartment. I think it was 20,000 pounds worth, as in like the currency. 
um, and also a few female wigs. When they went onto his computer and cell phone as well, he had searched bondage a few times. He visited a few bondage websites and they also released to the public that he had been seen at a few gay bars a handful of times. And I know authorities went to check security footage to see if maybe, you know, he had a relationship or something that, and that went wrong and that's what happened. But despite claiming he had been at all these gay bars, authorities were never able to find, at least Metropolitan Police, they were never able to find any evidence that he was actually at any of these. But this started a media crap show. You guys, I'm sure you can imagine that the media just decided to cling onto this information and throw it everywhere. They focused all of their attention on, you know, their speculations about why he had women's clothing and why he would search bondage and what he was into. And completely lost track of what was the actual problem, what the issue was. And his previous landlords even came forward and they said that one night, um, and this was back when he was working at GCHQ, he apparently started screaming help in the middle of the night and it woke them up and they were scared obviously and you know ran in to check on him. And they said when they got into his apartment, he was either handcuffed or tied to his headboard. And he, and they asked him, you know, what on earth happened? Who did this to you? Like, are you okay? Did someone do this? And he said, you know, no, I did this to myself because I wanted to see how long it would take for me to get out. And the landlords even stated they didn't believe him. They thought he was, you know, in the middle of some sort of sexual um, experience or act. And this just further pushed the idea that Gareth did this to himself, that he put himself in the bag. A lot of people believe maybe, you know, if it wasn't sexual, he was interested in escapism, which is something that a lot of people are fascinated by. They put themselves in situations that they are not sure they can get out of. And then um, it's like, it's like Houdini basically, you know, just escaping from a box or, you know, managing to get yourself out of something locked without the key. But there were no searches like that on his computer. Escapism just didn't seem to be a thing. A lot of people speculated that maybe he was doing this because of something work related um, and that's why they just couldn't find any trail behind it of his interest in it. Um, but a lot of people also said it could have been something called claustrophilia, which is basically a sexual fetish where someone enjoys being in very, very, very confined spaces. Now I've seen a lot of people say, oh, well claustrophilia though, it's not about putting yourself in a bag, you would never do that. But that's actually exactly what this fetish is. If you do any bit of research on it, um, you you can see that these people enjoy being put in boxes and locked in trunks and they enjoy being put in bags like this um, in cages. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's a very personal thing for people. So, I mean, even though it might seem odd to us that you would put yourself in a bag, like that is something that people actually enjoy. and can't exactly be ruled out in this situation. But despite all of these theories, you know, spinning around and basically all because his personal private information had been released to the public, despite the fact that it was kind of unrelated and not their business, um, the issue with this is that there was no attempt for him to get out. Even if he wasn't to escapism or if he was into claustrophilia, there would have been a time where he probably would have panicked and freaked out and tried to get out of the bag. And there would have been evidence of this, you know, maybe him scratching at something, there would have been fibers underneath his nails, but there was absolutely nothing. And claustrophilia and escapism also wouldn't explain why the heat was up so high in the apartment. Now, if you look at this from a common sense perspective, at least in my opinion, it's quite obvious why this situation screams murder. And this was something that was planned and planned a very specific way. Heat will obviously decompose a body. If you want a body to decompose as fast as possible, you are going to turn the heat up so incredibly high. So I completely can understand that. I think the locked bag was also a way to keep someone out of sight and in a confined space. Maybe after decomposition happens as much as it possibly can, then the bag, you know, kind of contains a lot of things. This is disgusting and horrifying to talk about, but it's just the reality of it. The bag would then contain a lot of the things that you can then take and dispose. Um, and on top of that, if you didn't want to have to kill someone with your bare hands, if you wanted to leave as little evidence behind as possible, you didn't want to use a weapon that could be traced back to you, um, you want to make things harder to solve, suffocating someone in a bag would make a lot of sense or you know, poisoning them would make a lot of sense. And then if you also think about it, his apartment was on the top floor 
I think he might have been put into the bathtub if this was a murder in order to contain, you know, any fluids or anything like that so they wouldn't leak maybe down below and someone would be alerted to his decomposing body faster than someone may have wanted. I just think this is something that's so incredibly calculated um, and it worked out and whoever did this, it worked out in their favor because there has been nothing left behind. The inquest went on for a while and it was honestly an absolute disaster. All you have to do is watch any of the media coverage on this, people going back and forth at each other. There are just daggers being thrown from every direction, but it was finally determined that this was not something Gareth could have done to himself. First of all, again, there were no DNA or fingerprints found on the lock or the zipper. If he had put himself in there, it would be all over the zipper from him struggling trying to do that. It would be all over the lock from him trying to lock it. And he would not have been able to wipe this off after it was locked. Um, and apparently experts came in and attempted to lock themselves in the exact same kind of bag. And the one man who did it, I think almost 400 times, he was even smaller than Gareth and he was not successful a single time. Now on that note, I have watched a video on YouTube of someone successfully doing this. So I don't know what to think. I mean, clearly it is possible because someone has done it. I think there's actually been a few people that have done it, but for some reason this expert said it was impossible. It was believed that he may have been threatened and stripped down and then put into the bag. He was possibly drugged maybe and put into the bag, um, but it was apparent to a lot of people that he willingly got in there or he, he at least did not put up a fight while being put into the bag. Now, in my personal opinion, that makes me believe he was drugged and put in there or poisoned and put in there. I don't think he would willingly get in and then just not fight back as he's suffocating. Um, but either way, it would have been just too difficult post-mortem to put his body into the position it was in in the bag because he would have been too rigid at that point. So he was alive going in there. But the entire inquest ended up being put into question right as it ended. I think just two days before the inquest ended, it was found that SIS had kept a lot of evidence to themselves. First of all, the counterterrorism department was in charge of investigating all of the MI6 co-workers that Gareth worked with. They apparently, I don't know if they did this wrong or they just didn't pass along information or it was questionable the way that they handled it, but I just know there was a lot of issues regarding the questioning of the co-workers. Um, there was also a huge issue because nine memory sticks had been found in Gareth's work locker and they contained sensitive information again, I guess. And so SIS did not tell anyone about them. Not in the original investigation, not in the inquest until two days before the inquest ended. Um, that's a huge problem. And I don't think anybody but SIS to this day still knows what exactly is on these memory cards. It's like once this information came out and it was said, you know, you're not above the law, you have to give us this information. We have to know if this is related. They still were like, oh, I, I can't do that. I can't give you these memory cards. This again created a huge uproar because while the SIS is protected, they are a secret agency because of what they do to an extent they are not above the law. If there is a criminal case happening, a potential murder, a suspicious death that they are tied to in any way, shape or form, they're required to work with other agencies and the government. And they just were not doing it. The coroner Fiona Wilcox came out during the inquest and ruled that it was officially an unnatural death, either by poison or asphyxiation. So the two other causes that I mentioned previously, she stated that during the inquest, she believed the bag had actually been moved to the bathtub. I can't find anywhere why she believes that, um, but she just believed that it was put into the bathtub with Gareth in it. He did not get into it in the bathtub or was placed in it into the bathtub, but this kind of opened up the possibility that this isn't even where he might have been killed or where he died. This bag may have been somewhere else and transported to his apartment and put into the bathtub. She even called out the investigative agencies hard. I'm honestly shocked at the way reporters called out these agencies in different interviews. And then Fiona went in 
on these agencies. She said that evidence was hugely mishandled. Some evidence was turned in far too late or it was just completely missing altogether. She said that the entire investigation was mishandled. She even said that she believed that all of the information that suddenly came out about his personal life, things that only investigating agencies would have had, it all came out right at the inquest as it started. And she believed this was an attempt to manipulate the public into viewing the circumstances and the evidence a very specific way and to kind of take the spotlight and move it somewhere else. So this made people lose it because they're thinking this corner is basically stating that the government is trying to convince everyone something else happened to this man. So basically a cover up. The Metropolitan Police, after the inquest, decided to start yet another investigation that lasted 12 more months because they were not at all happy with the findings of the inquest. And you guys, <laughs> I can't help but laugh. Um, what they found is honestly quite comical. I guess the conclusion that they came to. So they said at the end of this 12 month investigation, after the inquest and after another original investigation, they said it was probably an accident, like quote for quote, like exactly what they said. They said, oh yeah, we looked into this again and it was probably an accident. Metro police said that they believed he may have been again, I've already gone through this, attempting this escapism act and it went wrong. They even said that he may have been again in the middle of something sexual and that went wrong. But they said that since there was no evidence of anyone else there, that it was safe to conclude he put himself in the bag and it was an accidental death. They completely ignored the plethora of evidence that suggests there was no way he put himself in the bag and just called it a day by saying it was probably an accident. Now this case has never been classified as a murder investigation, only a suspicious death. Um, I am pretty certain that it remains this way. It is still just being seen as a suspicious death and I don't think there's any further investigating going that I know of. It kind of created this huge uproar but then it like very quickly fizzled out which mm, when I get to the theories, I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. All of this random information just kept like leaking out into the public and a lot of the time it was coming from kind of questionable and sketchy sources and I don't know how much of this has been confirmed. Um, so just take that for what you will. I had a few bits of information come from what seemed to be reputable sources, but it's also coming from people that are claiming to be like retired MI6 agents and working with the KGB and like all these different agencies, but they don't want their names out there and they don't want this information said. Um, and I don't know if their identity was ever confirmed by these news sources. So again, this could all just be speculation or people just coming out to say what they want because this is very, this can very easily be turned into something like sensationalized and very high mystery and people tend to want to throw themselves in the middle of that. So here we go. Apparently information came out that while at MI6, Gareth had breached his clearance to get access to a guest list for a party that Bill Clinton was hosting. He did this because a friend allegedly asked him to do so. This friend was supposed to be attending the party and maybe just wanted to know who else was going to be there. Honestly, the reasoning, I have no idea. Now, I've seen a lot of people say, oh, well, that's nothing. Like, that doesn't make any sense. That's not a reason, you know, to, for anyone to want to come after Gareth, except yes, the absolute heck it is. Um, the kind of people that end up at those functions, at those sort of events, there's no telling. If the wrong person got their hands on a guest list, like, do you guys understand the kind of people that go to that? Do you, there, that would turn people that are huge, people that I'm sure plenty of people want to assassinate or, you know, get their hands on, it turns them into sitting ducks with targets on their backs. So I feel like there could be plenty of reasons behind that as to why someone would be very upset that Gareth got this information. And on top of that, I mean, he somehow was smart enough and managed to breach his own clearance to get higher up to access this information. 
that's a huge no-no even within MI6. Like you, you can't do that. You can't just breach your clearance and tons of people not have issues with it. There was also information that came out claiming that the Russian mafia was involved. They allegedly admitted to killing Gareth because he found some type of money trail that they had left behind. And I don't know exactly what that entails, what that involves, but um, they allegedly, again, try to blackmail him because of this into becoming a double agent for them. And Gareth apparently denied, so they said that they poisoned him with a fast acting poison in his ear. And this is why we are where we are. Now, again, I don't know if the Russian mafia is just gonna come out and admit that. There apparently was some sort of agent that had been working in Russia that claimed this and then, you know, came over to the UK and then, that's where he relayed this information to the media and authorities. But again, I don't know if there's anything at all to back that. There is also a lot of speculation in this case that some form of government was involved. And if I'm being real honest, this is kind of like the side I'm leaning to. Um, I mean, he apparently had breached his clearance, like I said, which is not good at all. Um, and then he had these memory sticks found in his locker. Was that information that he was not supposed to have? We already know he was going above and beyond to get information for private reasons and for friends. So there's no telling what he may have had that he wasn't supposed to, that he was hiding. It makes you wonder if he just was digging a little bit too far or maybe helping someone else out maybe another government out, maybe another agency. Maybe he just knew too much or had too much or went too far. This kind of makes me wonder about the timing of all of this. He said that there was friction with MI6 and he was a week away from going back to GCHQ and all of a sudden he goes missing and the same place he's having friction with that he's working for and about to leave doesn't report that he's missing and then all of a sudden they find all these memory sticks in his locker that they don't tell anybody about. I mean, it just seems a little bit sketchy in my personal opinion. I know there's so many more theories out there. I mean, all different kinds of government are being thrown under the bus on different forums about this. Um, you know, all these different things that he could have done, these people that he could have been in contact with. I know there's a lot of people that said maybe he was working undercover and then something happened. But then there's also a lot of people that are like, hey, maybe he really was into these different sexual fetishes and maybe he did have a relationship with someone and, you know, something went wrong. Um, but I personally just, I think it's a little bit too too odd that he went missing, you know, while having issues with a company, that same company did not report that he had gone missing or seemed to bat an eye when he went missing. And they were very uncooperative the entire investigation and very secretive. Now, could that be explained just because they are a secret intelligence agency? Yes. But could they be using that as, you know, an upper hand for themselves? Possibly. I'm so interested to see what you guys think about this because I went down so many rabbit holes <laughs> while I was researching this. I honestly could probably go on forever about it. I want to have conversations with you guys down below because this is also something that I'm not really familiar with. I'm not from the UK. I don't know a lot about, you know, MI6 history and, you know, things they're known for doing. I just, it's not something I'm familiar with. So let me know what you guys think down below. I know a lot of you guys may also have experienced this because this did happen in 2010. So you might remember things that I couldn't find any longer online. It's really heartbreaking to me because the family is so incredibly frustrated because it's like all these agencies were so busy either trying to be in like a pissing contest to see who could solve something first or they were too busy protecting their own asses, excuse my language you know, instead of trying to figure out what happened and find the answers, it's like they were withholding information to make themselves not look bad or, you know, to keep all these secrets. And because of that, the family likely will never have answers. You know, they had to deal with his private life being blasted all over the media. And there's always going to be the group of people that, you know, sees that for what it is and, sees the potential that it may have to, you know, be relevant to the situation. But then because of what it was, there's always gonna be that large group as well that just uses that to trash him and say bad things and make assumptions 
and you know write him off and I think that's absolutely disgusting. Um, I don't know if it's relevant. I can see places where it may have been, but I think it probably just did more harm than good when they originally released all that information. On that note, you guys, I'm going to go ahead and go. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to Gareth's story. I cannot wait to see what you guys think in the comment section down below. As always, if you have not already, hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Hallen fam. So hopefully we can bring them home together and I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.